Hello friends, welcome to my video lecture. Today in this lecture, I will be talking about new criticism. The first thing that we should understand is what exactly is new criticism and how is it different from traditional criticism? The new criticism as a literary movement started in the late 1920s and 1930s against the traditional criticism. According to the new critics, they were of the opinion that traditional criticism or traditional critics were concerned more with the external factors than the text itself. New critics emphasized on the importance of text, whereas they found that the traditional critics took into account the external uh, elements, which were, according to the new critics, flaw. What are the external elements? The author's uh, biography, the author's psychology, the author's style of writing, the socio-political situation in which the author particularly produced that text. All these elements are the external factors which the new critics uh, found it to be very uh, defect defective. The new critics, and here comes the first concept that the new critics gave. The new critics believed in the autonomy of the text. Now, what is autonomy of the text? Autonomy of the text means where the text is just only by the printed words on that particular text. A poem is just only by the printed matter on that page, the printed matter of the poem. No external factors, be it the author's background, be it the author's psychology, be it the socio-political situation which forced or which propelled the poet to produce that poet was taken into account. For the new critics, autonomy of the text was important. For the new critics, the new critics emphasized that whatever meaning has to be deciphered, whatever meaning has to be derived, it has to be deciphered and derived from the text itself. And there they have given the concept of autonomy of the text, text as autonomous. And they said that there are few elements through which uh, one can decipher the text. And what are the elements that they give? The elements that they gave was characterization, <coughs> literary devices, setting, time and place, point of view, metaphors, symbols, paradox, irony, and one more thing, ambiguity. These are all the elements, according to the new critics, which can determine the meaning, the intrinsic meaning of the text. Now, before we move ahead, let us first understand how did new criticism start? So it has its roots to practical criticism. It has its roots to two major uh, people, major art, uh, creators who paved the way for new criticism. The first is T.S. Eliot and the second is I.A. Richards. T.S. Eliot's two seminal works, one is traditional and individual talent and Hamlet and his problems. In Hamlet and his problems, T.S. Eliot talks about objective correlative. T.S. Eliot talks about the theory of impersonality, where he says in the theory of impersonality, T.S. Eliot said, that the poetry must be impersonal. The poetry must be, you know, they, they, they should be impersonal and this greatly influenced the canonical concept of new criticism. Then you have I.A. Richards' practical criticism. Now, one interesting uh, thing that I.A. Richards did was an experiment when he was in the Cambridge University with his Cambridge students. Once during... Uh, uh, the course of his lecture, he uh, issued some handouts as an assignment to the students. The handouts were 12, 13 poems given to the students. I.A. Richards removed the title of the poem and I.A. Richards also removed the name of the poet. And he gave the assignments to the students and he said that you try to find out, critically analyze this text. When I.A. Richard uh, received the responses, he was shocked. He was shocked and what he has termed as, he received stock responses. The responses which he received 
had nothing that much to do with the text but it was completely influenced by the external factors which I.A. Richards was greatly against of and which I.A. Richards said that this is the reason why traditional criticism could not justify the text. Now, one more thing that I would like to mention here is I.A. Richards was born in England but he spent his major professional career in America at the University of Harvard where his T.S. Eliot was born in America and he spent his major literary output professional career in England. Richard mainly focused, I.A. Richards focused on the text and he said that the meaning from the text has to be deciphered and he as I discussed earlier he gave the elements through which the meanings, the devices through which the meanings can be deciphered. I repeat once again, what are the elements and devices? One is characterization, one is point of view, one is setting, that is time and place, one is metaphor symbols, literary devices, paradox, irony, and most importantly, ambiguity. Now, when we talk about ambiguity, we, we come to the next part. That is uh, a very important uh, personality in this vogue after T.S. Eliot and I.A. Richards' uh, creation of works is William Empson. William Empson was the student of Richards and he wrote a treatise called Seven Types of Ambiguity in 1930. Now, the seven types of ambiguity is considered to be the first sustained attempt to Richards' principle of practical criticism by focusing exclusively on the language of literature and on the production of what he calls ambiguities through the employment of poetic devices. Now, if you take the general meaning of the word ambiguity, ambiguity is taken as a negative word, but ambiguity was celebrated in new critics, especially new critics like Empson. Now, after Empson's seven types of ambiguity comes the seminal work after which this particular canon has been termed as New Critics. That is the work by John Crow Ransom, New Criticism, which was published in 1941. It is after this creation, after the name of this creation by John Crow Ransom, this particular canonical group or uh, this particular group of people came to be uh, called as the new critics. After new criticism production by uh, John Crow Ransom in 1941, we have one more seminal work that is produced by the Yale University professor William K. Wimsatt and Monroe, his, his uh, collaborator Monroe C. Birdsley. And what, what are those works? Two essays, very, very significant and important that you need to pay attention and you need to understand the concept. One is, the essay's name is Intentional Fallacy. And the other essay's name is Effective Fallacy. Both the essays were published in 1946. And they were later published in a book called, written by Wimsett and Birdsley in a book called Verbal Icon, which was published in 1954. Now, coming back to intentional fallacy. What exactly is intentional fallacy? When a particular work of art is judged according to the intentions of the poet with which that particular work of art has been composed. For example, the seminal poem by Eliot, The Love Song of Prufok. Instead of focusing on the text of the poem, if I try to focus on the external factors, such as what was the psychological process that Eliot was going through? What did he think? With what thoughts in mind did he compose this particular poem? What was his intention? What was his message? If I continue about his, 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 that is Eliot's, Instead of focusing on the text, that is the love song of Prufok, that is called 
intentional fallacy when a text is not focused but the focus is how did the author of the text produce that work what was the psychology of author what was the thought process of the author that is called intentional fallacy and what is effective fallacy effective fallacy is when a work of art is judged according to the emotional output that the reader goes through that is called effective fallacy i will give the same example of love song of prufrock now when i read the love song of prufrock suppose i find the poem to be very realistic i find the poem to be very meaningful i find the poem to be very contemporary and i am not emotionally driven by the poem rather i rationally judge the poem and i am i am okay with the poem so according to the error of judgment of effective fallacy that poem is not successful because that poem has not been able to evoke that sense of feeling of awe sense of feeling of loss sense of feeling of you know loss of everything among in me you know so when a poem is not judged by the text of the poem rather it is judged by the emotional responses that the poem evokes among the readers that particular faulty you know form of uh, judging a poem is called effective fallacy both these uh, essays were written by uh, william k wimsatt and monro c birdsley in 1946 and both these essays were included in a book form called verbal icon which was published by the same authors in 1954 now uh, i would like to mention to you one more thing when we talk of new criticism we have to talk about two continents because uh, this this concept was going simultaneously at two places one is uh, britain or europe and the other is america or usa in britain we had new critics starting from william uh, uh, first is thomas eliot second is i richards third is wimsett and birdsley fourth is david dashius and so on these are all categorized under these people are categorized under british new critics and who are the american new critics the american new critics include alan tate john crow ransom r p warren and clinet brooks now to name a few to now i would also like to mention an important uh, point here that these american poets who are they alan tate J C Ransom, R P Warren, Clinet Brooks. They are also known as Vanderbilt University scholars, and they are also known as Southern Aggregarians. They are known as Vanderbilt University scholars because they belonged to this particular university, and they are called Southern Aggregarians because they are an in integral part of this movement of Southern Aggregarians, which took place in the southern part of America, which is a movement we can talk about in some other lecture. So these American new critics are also known as Vanderbilt University scholars, and they are also known as Southern Aggregarians. now if we uh, try to analyze the video lecture that we have gone through what are the things that we have studied just to recapitulate we try to understand what is new criticism how is it different from traditional school of thought or how is it different from traditional criticism new criticism completely emphasized on the text new criticism emphasized in the intrinsic quality of the text and because their approach was objective because whatever they had to talk they talked from inside the text their object their approach was very objective and that's the reason why new critics are also called objective criticism and new criticism is also called intrinsic criticism then we moved on to the the precursors uh, eliot and i richards then we moved to wimson uh seven uh, emsons uh, sorry emsons uh, seven kinds of ambiguity then we talked about the seminal work which was produced in 1941 from which this particular canon got its name that is 
uh, the new criticism by John Crow Ransom in 1941. We talked about two important, very significant essays by Wimsett and Brads, uh, Birdsley, uh, that is the intentional fallacy and the effective fallacy. And we also talked about uh, the American new critics and we also talked about the British new critics and how these American new critics, they are also known as aggregarian, uh, Southern aggregarians, and they are also known as Vanderbilt University scholars. Before ending the lecture, I would like to mention to you that there are some very canonical, very important texts which you need to pay attention to. You need to focus on those texts, which are they. One is Ransom's Essay Critical INC and the Ontological Critic. The second is Tate's essay, Emily and the Bibliographer. The third is uh, Brooks' book, The Well-Wrought uh, Urn, Studies in the Structure of Poetry. The fourth is Warren's essay, Pure and Impure Poetry. And the fifth is Wellick and Warren's book, Theory of Literature. Of course, you need to read Eliot's Traditional and Individual Talent, Eliot's uh, Objective Correlative Theory of Impersonality, and uh, th that is there in Hamlet and his problems. And of course, the seminal work by I. Richards, Practical Criticism. I hope I, I was able to, uh, you know, men, uh, to clarify to you the basic remnants of new criticism. I was able to, uh, you know, clarify what is effective fallacy, what is intentional fallacy, because this is a concept which is very confused sometimes. And I hope this lecture served you a, a, a small kind of a capsule form to know about new criticism. Hope to meet you soon. If you like the lecture, please subscribe my channel to get the updates for my next videos. Hope to meet you soon through my new video that I will upload soon in the coming days. Take very good care of yourself. Take care. Bye. This is Dr. Shoykot Banerjee signing off. Thank you very much.